All right, good afternoon, everyone. So next Thursday, President Biden and Vice President Harris will separately meet with President Zelensky of Ukraine at the White House. They will discuss U.S. support for Ukraine in its defense against Russian aggression and Ukraine's strategic planning. The president and the vice president will also emphasize their unshakable commitment to stand with Ukraine until it prevails in this war. Earlier today, the president addressed the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., where he discussed the important moment our country has reached. Inflation and interest rates are falling and the economy remains strong. As the president made clear in his remarks, this is good news for the overall economy because lower borrowing costs will support economic growth. The president knows there is still more to do to lower costs and protect the progress American workers have made. With that, I will turn it over to Jared Bernstein, who is back, uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, to further discuss the progress our economy has made under the Biden-Harris administration. All right, Jared, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Karine and her team for helping accommodate my visit, and to the CEA staff, who uh, always help me uh, be well prepared. Uh, earlier today, as you just heard, the president talked about the progress we've made in helping to build a more prosperous and equitable economy on behalf of the American people. He described that progress in terms of sustained low unemployment, job and real wage gains, solid real GDP growth driven by strong consumer spending and investment, he talked about the optimism embedded in the record 19 million people who have filed to start small businesses, the unsnarling of supply chains, the record energy production, the investment in key sectors of domestic production like clean energy and chips to ensure America's position in the global economy. And he marked this moment in our, pro in our economic progress by citing the actions taken by the Federal Reserve yesterday to lower the benchmark interest rate they control, an action that will help lower the borrowing cost for homes, cars, credit cards, and borrowing to start or build a business. The, F <clears throat> the Fed's action also underscores the historically unusual fact that all of the progress I just described occurred during a period of significant and critically important disinflation. Though these words, thankfully, did not appear in the president's remarks today, in CEA language, he was talking about the very low sacrifice ratio that has characterized this economic expansion. This ratio derives from the historically negative relationship between unemployment and inflation. It describes how many percentage points of unemployment, for example, we would have to accept to get inflation back down to its target. That concept is why, not that long ago, we saw prominent headlines and commentary assuring us that it would take much slower growth. One headline proclaimed a 100 chance of recession uh, Nick, uh, last year to achieve the disinflation that has occurred. And yet here we are with 6.5 percentage points of CPI disinflation and the solid economic conditions I described above. Quoting Chair Powell from yesterday, quote, I don't see anything in the economy now that suggests the likelihood of a downturn is elevated. The U.S. economy is in a good place. More specifically, the economy is growing at a solid pace with inflation coming down closer to our 2% objective over time, and the labor market is in solid shape. Now, we underscore these dynamics in CEA's most recent blog post, if I can get figure one. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a blog post that you can get from the CEA uh, website. What this shows is, uh, in fact, uh, inflation uh, over uh, the period where it uh, went up and disinflated uh, against a set of forecasts that were made by the blue chip forecasters, by CBO, uh, by the uh, uh, Fed's uh, uh, FOMC uh, SEP committee. And you see that the inflation forecasts were, were quite, quite good, quite accurate. They pretty much followed the dark line, which is the actual line. Next slide. That gets very different when you look at the unemployment rate. In fact, the title of our blog is, is How the Economy Defied the Forecasts. Here we have the forecast 
predicting unemployment would have been uh, very high in order to uh, achieve that much disinflation. And in fact, what we have here in this shaded area is the uh, most optimistic and the most pessimistic uh, estimations of where the unemployment would be, uh, unemployment rate would be by the blue chip forecasters. These are the most optimistic because they're the lowest. We beat the most optimistic forecast when it came to unemployment. If, next slide please, um, if in fact the forecasts were correct, this is how much more unemployment we would have had, how much more unemployment households and American workers would have been stuck with if we hadn't beaten even the most optimistic forecast on unemployment. And you can see those numbers range from one to north of five million unemployed persons whose fate was avoided by the trends I've showed you thus far. And finally, figure four uh, shows the same dynamic for GDP. Again, beating the most optimistic forecast of the blue chip, which in this case would be the uh, uh, upper part of the shaded area. I'll close with another important reference to the president's speech uh, today. Uh, uh, the, the part about, and you heard this from Kareem, our work is not done. Uh, as he put it, I am not here to take a victory lap. I'm not here to say the job is done. I'm not here to say we don't have more work to do. Of course we do. Our cost-cutting agenda in particular is as urgent today as it was before the Fed acted, but that fact should not prevent anyone from recognizing the progress we've made, the expectation defying ongoing expansion, and the work, productivity, and grit of the American people to get us where we are today. And with that, I'll take your questions. All right. Thank you. Um, you're, you know, one of the people that the president would call if he has any questions about the American economy. I was curious to ask you, um, what would you say is an economic is issue that the president these days is asking the most sort of probing questions yeah. to you about, whether it's a data point or a phenomenon or something that he's seeing in the economy? Well, I've been uh, talking to the president a lot in the last few days, as have met many other members of the team uh, in preparation for the speech he gave today. So I am uh, ready with uh, a, a, a very timely answer to that question. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same, it's a similar dynamic, similar conversation I've had with uh, Joe Biden since uh, I was his chief economist when he was the vice president. He wants to know how these economic developments, how the progress I've talked about today that he spoke about affects uh, uh, working families like the one he grew up in. And right now, that relates a lot to the interest rate cut. How does a cut in interest rate ripple through to the economic lives of working American families? And the answer that I shared with him and I'll share with you is uh, lower costs of lending, lower costs of uh, a mortgage, lower costs if you want to take out a loan to improve your home, lower costs of auto loans, credit cards, if you want to start or expand a small business, lower interest rates are uh, really meaningful to people. It's one of the, uh, uh, it's really one of the key uh, economic variables in, in a lot of people's uh, lives through that channel of, uh, of borrowing costs. And that's certainly, I think, a timely example of, uh, of, of things we've discussed lately. And how did you prepare him for the possibility of the Fed making the kind of cut that it did yesterday? Uh, having conversations much like the one we discussed. I mean, uh, we're very careful, as you know, to respect the independence of the Fed. Uh, but of course, we're always going to talk about uh, any important dynamic or variable in the economy. And so uh, this is a conversation uh, we've had. And uh, it, you know, it, it goes right to the impact of uh, the uh, the, um, uh, right, it goes right to the impact on the economic lives of the families we discussed. I think also part of this discussion has been about um, uh, the trajectory of inflation. And here, I want to underscore something I uh, said in my, in my topper, but also the president leaned in today. Very important to him. We've had a lot of discussions about this, so direct answer to your question. He's been very interested in these predictions that said, uh, sorry, you can't get this much disinflation, six and a half points on the CPI, without accepting a much worse unemployment rate or much slower GDP growth. That is the more kind of traditional within those shaded areas in the figures I showed. 
And the president uh, felt strongly that we were not going to achieve disinflation on the backs of working people. We needed to get there through improvements in the economy supply side, through energy production, uh, through cost reductions in the areas where we've tried to do more of that. So maintaining the strong economy on behalf of working families while getting to lower inflation has been essential for rising real wages and incomes, and that's what we've seen. Thanks for being here. Um, you know, one of the issues that has still proven to be very difficult is, is getting housing prices down. Um, can you walk us through, do you have any kind of numbers to put on housing prices and the, 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 the importance that they play within the CPI bundle in terms of, you know, now that we've had the interest rate cut, how much more is, is it, it, you know, our housing prices going to come down? And then I asked this question yesterday, but I want to ask you again. I mean, with the escalating tensions in the Middle East and with the possibility of a broader regional war uh, growing, um, how do you assess uh, the impact on uh, prices, both in terms of oil and, and other factors? Okay, so on housing prices, uh, you're very uh, you're very much correct that um, the uh, uh, CPI um, as well, well, the CPI in particular, but um, the index I was showing earlier, which is the PCE different index, uh, th uh, they, they have uh, heavy weights for housing, CPI in particular. In the CPI, the housing weight is, I think, around 35%. It's uh, the sing shelter is the single largest weight, uh, I believe, in, in the CPI. And so it, it, it's very impactful. And one of the ways we uh, showed that in a recent blog that we did, which I think, uh, you know, I, I, I commend to you because we really dive into your question uh, for, on the CEA website, is uh, we pointed out that if you look at core inflation over the past year in the CPI, that that's inflation without uh, energy and food, 3.2%. Core inflation CPI without shelter, half of that. 1.6%, so it really gives you a flavor of how heavy that weight is. Now, there are two things going on with housing prices in the CPI. One is cyclical or mechanical, and the other is, or maybe call it, you know, something, well, one is, is cyclical or mechanical, and the other is structural. So the mechanical part is that as rental inflation has rolled over, and it really has, I mean, uh, the inflation of rents was highly elevated, it's now back to levels that we saw pre-pandemic, and this is rental inflation now, not rental, not, not the price level, but the inflation. As that has rolled over, most CPI analysts have expected that to filter into the index by now. We haven't seen that, it's a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, I think Powell talked about it yesterday, he referenced that the other part of shelter costs, owner equivalent rent, which I won't get into the details, um, that's been uh, coming in uh, stronger than expected. So, uh, uh, but, but simply based on the mechanics of the lags and the rollover in rental inflation, uh, we still expect that to show up as easing in the, in, in the CPI's housing component. But where we, but much more important from our perspective, and from the Biden administration, I'd say the Biden-Harris administration, because Vice President Harris has ambitious plans, is to deal with the structural problem. We have a 15-year in the making shortage of affordable housing in this country. 15 years in the making, millions of uh, units shortfall. Um, and this is a market failure. And when there's a market failure, even the most classically oriented economists believe that there's uh, uh, important space for government intervention. And Vice President Harris and President Biden have, uh, I think, very uh, 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 important, and some of, in, in many cases, tried and true policy measures that would help reduce that shortfall. Expanding the low-income housing tax credit subsidizing developing and building uh, in, in ways that would make those deals, that make those developments pencil out in a way that they don't right now. Uh, we could spend a lot more time talking about housing policy, but you can, you can find it out there. I think addressing that shortfall is absolutely critical. I'd call it one of the biggest pieces of unfinished business we have, but we can't do it by ourselves. Congress needs to work with us, and there is zero reason why this should be a red or a blue or a D or an R issue. This shortage is pervasive in states across the nation. Wait, Middle East. Uh, on the Middle East, uh, so 
When it comes to geopolitical conflict, there are other people who can stand up here and talk about that with more authority. What I'll say is from an economic perspective, uh, of course we monitor uh, that very closely, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, instructive, important, and uh, in, in the context of my discussion to you today about how working families are doing, the breathing room that folks have been getting from low gas prices at the pump relative to where we were a year ago is really remarkable, especially when you consider the extent of geopolitical conflict in an an area where a lot of uh, an area of the world where, where where energy is often produced and 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 shipped, and you know this morning the gas price was three dollars and twenty two cents a gallon. I believe that's sixty eight cents per gallon down from where it was a year ago. That's real breathing room. It's one of the reasons why year over year CPI uh, is two point five percent in the last read, close to where it was pre pandemic. And uh, we think that's you know an important piece of breathing room. We would also argue that uh, the president's fingerprints uh, have been on that, both whether it's a matter of uh, the release of the strategic reserve, but also record energy production from all sources. Thank you, Eric. Um, the president has remarks that Ben Arago said that he had never spoken with the Fed chairman uh, since he's been in the White House. Um, that's obviously not true. He met in the Oval Office in 2022. Can you clarify uh, the president's remarks there and why did he say that? Sure. The president was saying that uh, he has not spoken to Chair Powell about interest rates. Uh, he uh, did not uh, pressure uh, Powell uh, and uh, has never done so. And in fact, in the speech today, uh, that was in the section about Fed independence and about the importance of uh, respecting and, and honoring that independence. It's obviously a stark contrast uh, with our predecessor. Never has the president spoken to Chair Powell about interest rates as president. Never has he pressured him. And you know the reason for that, and I speak to you now as uh, an economic historian, is that uh, countries where that independence have been compromised, economies where that independence have been compromised, have been brought to their knees by inflationary pressures time and time again. So by respecting the Fed's independence, the president has done a very important uh, uh, service and uh, has made a real contribution to where we are today. But he spoke an hour ago, what you saying? The president was saying he's not spoken to Chair Powell about interest rates as president. That's what he, that's certainly what he meant. And uh, he certainly didn't pressure him in that discussion that occurred in May of 22. Thanks, Jared. So this rate cut is colliding with presidential politics. At what point do you think Americans will start to feel the broad economic improvements that come with this rate cut? Would it happen before the election? Well, let me start with the political reference. Um, I'd like to quote from you uh, from a Wall Street Journal uh, lead editorial um, a couple of days ago. Quote, we don't agree with those who say a cut in rates this week is political or intended to help Kamala Harris. Now, I don't think the Ed Board of the Wall Street Journal is associated much with Democrats or liberals, so I take that as a, a statement that I uh, very much agree with on the non-politicization non political I don't know how to say that word, on the, uh, on, on, on the fact that what Chair Powell was doing was monetary policy, not politics. Now, your more you know, relevant question uh, is, is about when, these interest, when people start to feel these interest rate cuts, right? That was the other thing you asked. Um, interestingly, the first part of that answer is already. Because of the priced in dynamics, that is, the mortgage rate, uh, we talked about housing a minute ago, uh, you go back a few months, it was 7.5%. As of this morning, it was 6.1, I believe, 6.15, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, that's a big step down, and that occurred before uh, any Fed rate cuts took place, um, in large part uh, due to um, the expectation, market expectations, that those rate cuts were going to occur. So that's a priced-in effect. Now, then there's um, the dynamics in home lo in, in auto loans, in credit card loans, in business lending, and that can take anywhere from weeks to months to quarters. Uh, I think, uh, again, I think Powell talked about it yesterday, talked about it rippling through. So that, that occurs with more of a lag, uh, but, uh, but some of it's already priced in. And do you think the Fed waited too long to cut rates? I'm not going to comment on Federal Reserve monetary policy. Yeah, thanks. Um, Jared, uh, the previous president, no matter what the state of the economy, no matter what was going on, every single good thing that happened, he personally took credit for immediately, saying this is the best economy ever, we've had more jobs ever than anywhere in the universe, et cetera. <laughs> Should this president have done the same thing in order to 
cheer lead more and get people better, more excited about the state of things? I'm an economic advisor and I try to stay in my lane. Uh, so, you know, I have, over the course of my long relationship with President Biden, tried to give him a little political advice and, you know, frankly, he doesn't want to hear it from me. Uh, and I respect that. Uh, I, but let me say the following, what your question makes me think. I, I think that uh, where I go with that is what measures has President Biden taken wherein those policies help to lower inflation, help to tackle some of its causes, help to get us where we are today? Because I think that's actually an important part of this explanation. One of them we already talked about, by respecting the independence of the Federal Reserve, after his predecessor, predecessor repeatedly criticized the Fed and undermined its independence, simply by respecting that independence, uh, that helped uh, give them the space to do the monetary policy they believed to be uh, needed to get us here. Uh, as I mentioned again, and he cited this in his speech today, he unleashed record energy production to lower gas prices. He brought together, this is one of my personal favorites, uh, he brought together business and labor to fix our supply chains. This is the unsnarling of supply chains that was so important to the disinflation. And one of the charts that we highlight a lot at CEA is if you look at uh, measures of supply side snarling, uh, supply side constraints, and you plot them against the commodities or the good components within the CPI, they track each other very closely. In fact, I'll make sure to put that up on my Twitter feed, econjared46. Uh, <laughs> Give me a follow. Um, later uh, uh, today, uh, to show, to, and, and, and that that uh, that 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 is something that that this, uh, uh, comes directly from the supply side disruption task force of which uh, I and my colleagues here were uh, card carrying members. And now he's rebuilding our infrastructure and investing in the manufacturing uh, sector to strengthen these chains. He took on big pharma to lower prescription drug costs. So these are concrete measures that we've taken to help get us to where we are, and I would argue President Vice President's fingerprints are on these results. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, Vice President Harris um, has a you know, housing plan to build, what is it, about 3 million units. Um, should she become president, and should that legislation gets passed? How important would you say um, was the rate cut? Should her plan see, see the, the light of day? How important was it for the Fed to start lowering those rates? I think the, when, when you know, I, 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 without getting into, again, uh, the Fed, Fed's monetary policy or where they're going with interest rates, my initial comments about how important lower interest rates are uh, to consumers certainly applies to people uh, with a mortgage, looking for a mortgage, thinking about refinancing. I actually think it's a pretty different bucket relative to the uh, housing supply policies. I'll say more, more about the three million units. Uh, I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, but one thing that I think uh, and hope will happen is that uh, there are a lot of people, and actually Paolo talked about this as well, but uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, there are a lot of people locked into their current mortgages, okay? They want to move. You know, I've heard stories about divorced couples that want to move, but they're stuck in their house together because they have a 3% mortgage, and uh, what's out there in the market has been a lot higher. One of the things I think we see when mortgage rates start coming down, and I've talked to a lot of experts to try to figure out what that number might be, is the unlocking of that lock-in effect. Now, that doesn't necessarily lead to a lot more housing supply the way uh, her or the president's policies would, but it does create more churn. And people who are stuck in a starter home, they move to a different house, and that starter home becomes open. And that's the first rung on the ladder for families trying to get uh, into, uh, trying to uh, you know, build their, their wealth through home ownership. So that churn is actually, I think, would be quite helpful. And as mortgage rates come down, we expect to see that. Uh, when it comes to building 3 million affordable units, again, I won't uh, go through the uh, policy description. I, uh, I did a minute ago, but I will talk about one, um, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, of which expansion is a big part of both her and the President's agenda. Expanding LIHTC, which is a tried and true program for building affordable multifamily households, so this is on the rental side of the equation, is a policy that the banks like because they buy the credits from the developers, the developers like it because it makes the buildings pencil out, and um, housing advocates 
for low-income renters like it. That's a pretty rare triumvirate. So expanding LIHTC is a great idea, as is, uh, I mentioned earlier, a set of subsidies and tax credits to make building affordable housing pencil out in a way that it does not do so now. We also have some measures that help uh, ease some land use restrictions. I won't go into them now in the interest of time, but we have a, I think we have a, a, a powerful agenda in that space. Thanks, Jared. Um, last night, the former president proposed a temporary cap on credit card interest rates at around 10%. Is that something that the Biden-Harris administration thinks is a good idea? Uh, I think that happened today. Or when did, is it, what did you say? I thought it happened last night. Okay, maybe it happened last night. So uh, you know, I haven't had a lot of conversations about that yet with my colleagues, and uh, I would uh, wait before that. I, let me, I will say the following. Um, I think you have to be careful with things that um, people throw out there without a lot of thought or consideration. Um, you have to think about what kind of impact that might have. Uh, there's uh, uh, risk factors that go into uh, that kind of a, uh, a policy that might make it harder for a lot of people who need credit to be able to get it because companies won't sell it to them. So I think you have to be careful about unintended consequences. What I will say is that this administration has taken a very forward-looking and very, I think, uh, you know, pretty deep uh, run at many of these issues, helping to lower credit card fees, helping to make for one of the, uh, I think, most effective consumer financial protection bureaus, something that the Trump administration uh, consistently tried to shut down and gut. So when it comes to protecting consumers, uh, this administration, uh, I think, has a, a track record that isn't just about, you know, throwing off. Uh, ideas that may or may not be effective. Okay. Uh, um, two quick questions. One, the president in his speech today said that he expects interest rates to continue to fall. What gives him that confidence? I think what the president said was a reference to the uh, uh, SEP, the Survey of Economic Projections that comes out with the uh, Fed report yesterday, where they put where they th where, where members of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee put where they think interest rates are going. So he was simply referring to the published SEP. The uh, Congress is going to have to, before they leave, pass a short term spending bill of some kind. That there seems to be talks between three months and six months. Does uh, the council have a, a preference for kind of how that's worked out, how long it lasts? I think the way we would put it from the council and probably from uh, the administration writ large is that, well, let me actually, let me tell you where we would put it from the council. So we are at a, an economic moment that I hope I've conveyed to you today is unique, is strong, is uh, uh, leading to real wage and income gains. Disinflation amidst strong growth, lower inflation, lower interest rates, wage and incomes growing. Uh, this, is a, this is a solid economy. Now, you heard my quotes from uh, Chair Powell yesterday. Uh, and it's a, a, an economy that is getting back to the kinds of conditions that uh, 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 we've wanted to see for a long time. Making an own goal kick in that economy is uh, not only a bad idea, it's, it's malpractice. Uh, it doesn't, you know, see, it's not like um, these, uh, it's not like government shutdowns, you know, send the economy off a cliff, but they are a negative. Uh, they do lead to um, losses. Now, sometimes those losses are made up on the other side of the shutdown, but there is no reason for us to go through that. There's never a good time for that own goal kick, and it's particularly bad now. The only path forward is through bipartisanship. House Republicans should stop wasting time and work across the aisle to pass a short-term bill to keep the government open and provide emergency funding for disasters. Congress knows how to do this. It's not complicated. They've done it on a bipartisan uh, basis many times. Given the economic conditions I've been touting here today, given what we saw yesterday, given the information in the president's speech, uh, uh, this is uh, no time to be uh, uh, playing those kinds of games. Jared, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Farmers and ranchers, like to know. All right. Give Jared a follow on X. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually don't have anything else. Go ahead. See? Um, thanks, Green. Uh, first, for you, um, escalating tensions uh, from all the Israel uh, levies border uh, this morning. Uh, right now, has like uh, ongoing uh, bombing and shelling across the border. Mm -hmm. Um, has uh, the president tried to contain that front since October 7th? The administration held that out 
in, in the days after as a success. Has, has he reached the limits of his influence there in terms of keeping a, a lid on what had been a sibling conflict from growing into a larger conflagration? As you said, uh, we've spoken about this uh, and our concerns, uh, and so we've been very clear about this, our commitment, uh, obviously, to, to uh, Israel's security is ironclad. We are unwavering. Uh, um, raving against all uh, um, Iran-backed uh, threats, including Hezbollah. Uh, and what we have said, and, and I think this is kind of the question that you asked to me, is like the diplomatic resolution is achievable. That's what we still believe. Uh, it is urgent, obviously. Uh, the conflict uh, along the blue line has gone on for way too long, far too long, and uh, it needs to get to a resolution quickly. And so we're going to continue to do that, continue to have those diplomatic uh, conversations. Uh, we continue to work on a ceasefire deal. We believe that is that is uh, the way forward in, in um, calming and uh, lowering the temperature uh, there. And that's why we've been working around the clock to get that done. But we still believe a diplomatic resolution is the way forward here. We still believe that it is, uh, it is possible. And obviously, the urgency uh, continues to be, uh, continue to be that. The President's top representative was in the region you know, yeah. a day before those pages all started exploding. Uh, you know, it seems that U.S. influence, the President's influence, seems to not not really be working or it's not having an effect. I, I mean, look, I wouldn't, I, I don't agree. I mean, you, you started off saying that we, you know, we did have some, some, uh, some influence there in the beginning. I know, but you, you, did, you did say that we, we, it did, it was working uh, uh, in your question to me or moments ago, seconds ago. Uh, look, it doesn't, it doesn't stop from the fact that the president wants to see a diplomatic resolution. He believes it's achievable. Uh, obviously, it's urgent to get there. Uh, and that is going to continue. We are working around the clock. As you said, we've had representative, the president's uh, White House uh, uh, officials have been in the region, uh, continuing to have conversations about getting to a ceasefire deal. Uh, we're continuing to work with Egypt and Qatar, uh, and obviously uh, also Israel to get there. Uh, it is important that we get to that, uh, to, to a deal where we can get hostages home, where we can uh, end, end this war. That's what the president wants to see. He has said that himself, and, and also get that much needed, uh, continuing to get that much needed humanitarian aid uh, into Gaza. And so it's not going to stop us. It's not going to stop us from having uh, continuous conversations, uh, those diplomatic conversations that has been stating. And so we're going to stay steadfast. We're going to be very focused on here uh, with this. Uh, and so uh, we are going to continue to work on these alternative diplomatic solutions uh, so that we can create uh, conditions there that uh, uh, for uh, displaced Lebanese civilians to go home in, in the south and also for Israeli uh, civilians to go home in their in their in their north, and I'm talking about the, the blue line, obviously. A, a different topic. The president's hosting the Quad Summit um, in Wilmington, Delaware. We also understand that he's hosting bilateral meetings with those some of those with those world leaders at his private home. And what we currently understand is that the press will not be allowed into that bilateral meeting. Can you explain why that? This is the administration that held itself out as the most transparent in, in history, and that is not transparent. Uh, uh, why? Okay. Uh, let's talk about the other things that are happening over the course of the Quad Summit. Uh, look, we have stated one of the reasons we talked about having, uh, having the Quad Summit in Wilmington is because uh, the president believes how powerful it is to have that personal relationships. Uh, and he wants to, uh, certainly, he has, um, has developed personal relationships with uh, members of the Quad, and he wants to uh, do, do, he took it a, a step further, obviously, by having them in his hometown. Uh, and so diplomacy he sees as personal, politics is personal, foreign policy is personal. Uh, but we do believe there is going to be plenty of opportunities for press to have access. And I'll just, just to walk through a couple of things that we are going to be uh, going to be providing and the availability that you all will have. The Quad will have extensive press access and will be covered by all four uh, countries' pools. There will be three individual leader greets at Arch, uh, Archmere Academy, uh, where the president attended school. There will be a Quad family photo. There will be two major events, including a leaders level meeting of the Quad at a Newsy Cancer uh, moonshot event. And press will also see all of the leaders depart on Saturday evening 
evening after their intimate leaders dinner. Uh, in addition to these coverage opportunities, uh, there's going to be we're going to be arranging briefings, two briefings uh, that NSC is going to be providing uh, to the press pool. Uh, it's going to be NSC folks who who are focused on the subject matter uh, who will be available to all of you and answer some questions. Uh, and so I think that's going to be really important. Look, this is this is a, a private dinner. Uh, this is continuing the the personal relationships that he has, uh, fostering those personal relationships that he has with the leaders of the Quad. But there's going to be many other opportunities uh, for for the press to see exactly what's happening, to see uh, some not, handshakes. We're not going to see those private dinners. We're not going to see those bilateral meetings at his house. I mean, but President Bush hosted foreign leaders in Crawford. The pool was invited with President Trump, and President Walker, President Malaga. You know, I also didn't mention a press conference. Yeah, and. There's, and for this particular Quad Summit, we're not going to have a press conference. If we don't have a press conference for every, every, every uh, leader, uh, event, leader summit or event that we have, in this particular uh, scenario, when it comes to these private meetings, there won't be. Uh, that's going to be at uh, obviously uh, at his home. We're not going to have access there, but there are many, plenty of other opportunities where uh, we believe that uh, will be very fruitful for the press. There's going to see. Uh, uh, some uh, some opportunities to see uh, the president engage with the quad leaders, and I think that's important too. Thanks, Green. The FBI and other U.S. intelligence agencies said that Iranian hackers sent stolen information from the Trump, camp Trump campaign to individuals associated with the Biden campaign. This is before President Biden left the race. So, was the president made aware of this at the time? So uh, what I can say is that uh, we learned about the statement yesterday, uh, and uh, and the president has been made aware of it now. Uh, but we learned about the statement yesterday. Look, I, this is something that the FBI, ODNI, and CISA uh, have to speak to. It is they put out their statement, so I would refer you to them specifically. Uh, but more broadly, what I can say about this is that uh, uh, no foreign government, uh, like Iran or Russia, are actively uh, seeking to influence in our elections. Uh, and so we have said that we know that, and that's why we have seen we have seen you've seen us take uh, actions to hold accountable uh, those who seek to, who seek to undermine confidence. Uh, in our democracy, and we will continue to do so. And so that has been something that we've said from here. Uh, the ODNI has shared uh, with the American people what we know about the foreign influence, including by making uh, public the hack of the Trump campaign on August 19th and early September. The Department of Justice brought criminal charges against those involved in covert influence operations on behalf of RT. And so this is something that uh, obviously law enforcement is uh, and uh, our intelligence uh, 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 intelligence community is, is focused on, and so they're better to to certainly speak to it directly. Can you share what information was in those emails, and if the president has been made aware that of the information in those emails, that is emails? something that they could speak to. The president has made aware. We we saw the statement yesterday. Uh, that's when we were we learned about it. The president obviously is aware of it now, uh, but I would have to refer you to so the FBI. Didn't receive any advance briefing before that statement we were went made out. Aware, we were made aware of the state of when the statement came out yesterday. Now the president is aware himself. Uh, I would have to refer you to FBI, CISA, and ODNI. And just shifting gears a little bit, in general, what is the White House's view about the attacks in Lebanon? We're talking about exploding walkie-talkies and pagers and crowded civilian areas, children dead, including thousands injured. What I will say is uh, my NSC colleague was here yesterday. You all asked him multiple questions about, about what occurred. I don't have anything else to share beyond that. I've taken questions on this. I don't have any more information uh, to share on this, uh, and so I don't have anything beyond that. But is that a tactic that the U.S. would use, I, not asking for specifics? I'm not, going to, I'm not going to speak to this at this time. I'm just not. Um, during the president's remarks, um, he also spoke about the negotiations that you conducted to lower drug prices and seemed to suggest that you would be doing that on weight loss drugs. It was kind of an incomplete sentence. He said, watch, you know, we're doing this on weight, or, so can you just give us a copy of it? He said, watch, I don't have anything else to share. I don't have an announcement to make. Words, I'm not gonna, I don't have anything else to add. As you know, one of the things that came out of the, uh, the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act is to make sure that we did everything that we can uh, to uh, lower, lower health care drugs, pre prescription drugs. And that's what you see. You saw the president was able to beat Big Pharma. And so that is important to the American people, lowering those really uh, critical drugs that they need just to 
survive. You've heard stories uh, about uh, whether uh, folks are dealing with cancer or diabetes and how much it they get charged uh, by big pharmaceuticals. And now we're in a position where we can lower those drugs. I don't have anything to to say or to add beyond what the president shared today. And, uh, and just uh, to go back to the Middle East uh, for a moment. So, you know, I, I think, would you, would you agree that there has been a change or an escalation in the tensions in the region? And are you concerned about that? And what, what are you doing to sort of we, tamp down on We that? have said we are concerned about the, es the tension and afraid and concerned about uh, potential escalation. We have said that in the Middle East. We've been very clear. And we've also said that the way to move forward is the diplomatic resolution. We think it is achievable. Obviously, it is urgent. Uh, and so that's what we're going to continue to do, having those diplomatic uh, conversations. Diplomacy is key here. When we talk about uh, potential escalation, which we do not want to see, we do not want to see. Uh, and so we're going to continue to work towards that. Why not use the levers that you have? You know, the U.S. is sending weapon shipments to Israel why not? In other cases involving other countries, you have curtailed weapon shipments. In the case of Israel, you've put, you know, stopped, paused the 2,000 pound weapons. Why not send a signal by pausing weapon shipments to express your concern? Okay, so we are going to, our policy has not changed. Our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. That has not changed. Uh, and we have, we cannot forget what Israel is dealing with in that region. Uh, what we're talking about uh, having to uh, really uh, fight against, uh, you know, Iran-backed threats, including Hezbollah. This is something that we've been very clear about. Uh, and so, our support has not changed. It will continue. We do not have a policy change here. Uh, we're going to continue. Our commitment to continuing to support Israel's security uh, continues here. We want to see a diplomatic resolution. It is important. Uh, we want to see uh, that happen. Obviously, we, we believe it's achievable, uh, and that's how we want to move forward here. But we do not, we're not going to change our policy. Thanks, Karine. Um, an Israeli official told CNN that a senior advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu had presented to the Biden administration a new ceasefire proposal. Did that happen? So as I said multiple times before, and my colleagues here who have uh, from NSC who have been at, uh, at the podium, uh, we're going to continue to have discussions with Egypt and Qatar, uh, as well as Israel on a way forward. Uh, let's not forget, after Hamas brutally, brutally uh, murdered six hostages, I'm not going to get into specifics. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to negotiate from here, uh, but we are going to continue to have those discussions. I'm just asking if you can confirm that there was a new proposal shared with the U.S. Okay. Just going to continue to have discussions with Qatar and Egypt. I don't have anything else to share beyond that. Okay. Um, the proposal appears to be uh, for a permanent end to the war, release of all the hostages in Gaza, all Palestinian prisoners held by Israel also being released, um, and safe passage for Yahya Sinwar out of Gaza, does any of this sound feasible to you? We're in consultations with all the parties, Qatar, Egypt, Israel. I'm not going to negotiate from here. I'm not going to confirm anything from here. Uh, but we continue to have these discussions. We believe the best way forward is to get to a ceasefire deal. That's what we want to see. Bring home hostages, get more uh, immediate relief into Gaza. That's what we want to see and get uh, uh, and make sure we end this war. And that's what we want to see. And just finally, um, next week, the president and the prime minister are not meeting in New York City or on UNGA. Why is that? I don't have anything else to share beyond, the, uh, beyond what we've shared of what we're going to see with the president. If we have more information to share on what, uh, uh, who the president's going to meet with, uh, any other world leaders, we'll certainly share that well, with all of you. We've reported that they're not going to meet, so I'm just asking. I, I don't have anything else. As you know, when it comes to the prime minister of Israel, the president, he and the president have had multiple conversations over the course of almost a year now. Uh, they've met a couple of times. I just don't have anything to share beyond uh, reasoning as to why they're going to meet, if they're going to meet. I'm just not, I don't have anything else to share. Okay, Danny. Thanks, Kareem. Um, you said that the president believes that a diplomatic solution is achievable. Um, what, what on earth gives you the, you know, the, 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 the reason to believe that? I mean, what, what evidence is there that despite these, you know, this, yeah. the, the page of bombings and the, um, you know, now airstrikes today and Nasrallah saying it's a declaration of war, 
what you know what what is there that makes you believe that it makes the president believe that because the president continues to believe that we have to be optimistic and diplomatic resolution is the best way when we think about foreign policy when we think about these type of relationship having diplomacy having those conversations is critical is key and the president has been successful in doing that in the past three and a half years so that's what he wants to see he believes that is still achievable he believes that is still, still achievable we are not saying that we don't have concerns uh, we do not want to see escalations. Uh, we are not saying that the conflict that we have seen, uh, it truly has, or along the blue line, has gone for too long. We are acknowledging that. Uh, we're going to continue to have this di di diplomacy. It is important to do so. Uh, and that's the way we see this president sees moving forward. Yeah. First Lady uh, will be traveling to Mexico October the 1st. Um, to attend the inauguration event yep. uh, of uh, Claudia Sheinbaum. Um, Vladimir Putin is also invited to the event. Is that potential encounter something that worries the White House? No. Okay, and considering the uh, relevance and the influence the U.S. has in the region, in the Middle East, considering that you provide most of the arms, uh, I, what, is, do you, what, what, what do you think is the precise goal uh, Israel has in these attacks in Lebanon? I can't speak to, to, uh, to any of, I can't speak to this. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it where we have been in the last two days. You heard from my colleague yesterday. Um, look, the, going back to um, the inauguration uh, in Mexico, the first lady, I talked about this yesterday, she's looking forward to being there. It's a historic moment. Uh, that's gonna be her focus in supporting uh, the president-elect and being there being there with the, the U.S. delegation, where she's very much looking forward to it. I'm not going to speak to what President uh, uh, Putin is going to do or not do. Okay. Thanks, Karine. And thank you for clarifying when the president first learned of this Iranian influence campaign um, or attempts to reach people associated with the campaign. Now, what is now the Harris Walls campaign says it was people associated with the campaign, not campaign staffers, who received emails from Iranian hackers. Were any of those people associated with the campaign, as they put it, members of the Biden family? I would have to refer you to FBI, CISA, and ODNI on this. They can speak to the specifics. I would also have to refer you to the campaign. And, well, that's the thing. He's, yeah. he's not a member of the campaign anymore, and apparently these people weren't either. That's why we're asking you here I, at the White House. And this is, uh, this is something that the FBI, CISA, and ODNI can speak to. I cannot speak that to so that from here. these people were White House officials who weren't on the Wilmington payroll at the time, yeah. being contacted through their personal email, you couldn't say. You have to speak to FBI, ODNI, and says it on this one. Regarding the Quad, is the Vice President attending any of the meetings on Saturday? Uh, she will not be attending any of the meetings on Saturday. And the decision not to allow reporters to see the bilaterals that he'll be having Friday afternoon and Saturday, does this have something to do with the foreign press pools from India, Japan, and Australia? Is there a security concern with having them on the grounds of his home? What I can say is the president wants to have a personal moment with the leaders. Uh, this is a relationships that he has had with leaders of the Quad uh, throughout, obviously, his tenure here as president. He wanted to have us uh, uh, continue to fo foster uh, those personal relationships. He wanted to have a private moment with them, continue to grow uh, those relationships. That's what this is about. But not the fact also that he's not having a press conference around this. Was that a request of any of the other governments? I I can't speak to private conversations that uh, our folks at NSC are having with the different countries. I don't have anything to add to that. What I want to say is it is important to him inviting them to Wilmington, his home state, his home, his home city, his home state, obviously Delaware. It was important for him to have these personal touches. It was important to him uh, to do something uh, that he hadn't done before. Bring him to his home, Did bring him to his home city. But there's him. going to be plenty of opportunities. It's not like we're, we're, we're not allowing all of you to see many other things that are going to develop with throughout the day. I mean, I just went through them. A quad family photo. He's going to take them to the uh, to his high school. You all are going to be there. There's going to be some really important uh, important announcement about cancer moonshot. You all are going to be there. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity to see them when they leave on Saturday as well. Depart. You'll see him saying goodbye to the leaders on Saturday. There's going to be there's there's but but can you also appreciate 
I hear you all, but can you also appreciate that we have created other opportunities? There is this They're one. They're called photo ops. That's what you've created. They're not a press conference, which we would prefer. And what I was go ahead. Go what ahead. I was going to suggest is what baffles people in this room, especially for those who are watching this and wondering why on earth do we harp on these kinds of things. What baffles us is this is a president who, from day one, committed to be the most transparent president possible, who has given speeches at various events saying that he stands for and, and, and respects the freedom of the press. And here is a great opportunity yeah. to stand with the leader of the world's largest democracy, India, and two other key democracies who are from a region of the world that is struggling to maintain democracy. Why not face questions from reporters in a free press? So which in part? That okay, so which part are you asking me about? Are you asking me about why going? Why are we being on <laughs> so, these meetings so in the there, house? And why is there no press conference? Okay, which I think so, okay, was the so, crux of the negotiations, or at least the no, conversations I, no, that went I, on earlier today. I hear you, but there are two things that I'm being asked. So let me. Not every not every opportunity that we have when we do have these foreign uh, foreign leaders here do we have a press conference that is not unusual we have gone many times back and forth about also I, I, I totally understand there's been some bilats some there's been some other visit where there has not been some press conferences right that is not unusual I've we've had yes. conversation excuse me excuse me I'm not speaking to you I really am not let me have my conversation with Ed let me have my conversation with Ed. Thank you. And so it is, it is not unusual for us to have this back and forth and talk about why it is happening or not happening. So that is, I'll put that there. The other part is this is an opportunity for the president to have a personal moment uh, with the leaders. We have created other opportunities for you all to see him with those leaders, standing with those leaders, shaking hands with the leaders, giving them, giving them opportunities to see uh, his high school, right? Places where he, uh, that he's very, well, very much connected to that you all will see. He's gonna make a really important announcement about the cancer moonshot. We believe, and I know there is a difference of agreement here, right? Is that there's going to be plenty of opportunities for press to have access to see him with these other leaders. And so we have made sure, made sure, and people, I think people actually care about photo ops. Photo ops are indeed important because you, and maybe there'll be questions taken during those photo ops. You never know, right? Um, but a formal press conference on this trip is not going to happen with this particular event is not going to happen. We have gone back and forth on many other events, so that's what I'm saying is not unusual. We, are, we wanted to make sure that there were plenty of press access throughout the day, and we believe we have done that. And let's see how the day goes. Let's see how the day goes on Saturday. I just want to be there when Modi, when Modi gets to see the Corvette, that's all. But I say, have another, say that, I'm sorry. I said we want to be there when radio. Modi gets to see the Corvette. That's all. Oh, the Corvette. <laughs> um, on an unrelated matter, <laughs> yes. uh, the Republican was. gubernatorial candidate in North Carolina apparently is not dropping out despite pressure from his party yeah. and some pretty salacious news reports. I'm just curious if the president is tracking what's been going on there, so, or if the White House has any other comments. As you know, the president was making this really important economic speech. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to him about this particular uh, this particular event that just occurred. Uh, I haven't uh, really seen the stories. I've seen, you know, uh, I've heard from my staff about uh, a little bit about this. Uh, what I can say, and I want to say off the top, is that, you know, Anti-Semitism is never acceptable. It is wrong. It is wrong. And so we have to be really clear about that. Uh, elected le leaders have to be really clear about that. They need to be responsible about calling that out. Uh, as far as the uh, ongoing uh, stories and uh, as it relates to this race, I just don't have any comment for you. I, and I haven't had a, se a second to talk to the president since he made a really big speech. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, two questions, one related to kind of uh, your topper about Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Senator J.D. Vance said in an interview a few days ago, and I'm quoting him, um, I think Washington has left Taiwan in a really crappy position because we went, we sent all our weapons to Ukraine. Well. And, uh, so do you agree with his assessment? Does the Biden administration <coughs> believe that the U.S. can protect Ukraine and Taiwan at the same time? Look. Um, I'm not going to go into everything that 
uh, someone who is in part of this 2024 election, everything that he's saying or they are saying, uh, certainly would have to refer you to the campaign. Um, I think you have seen this president be uh, a leader on the global stage. Uh, I think you have seen a president that has brought partners together and allies together uh, to certainly show support uh, for Ukraine. It is not just the U.S. that is uh, in engaging and giving that support to Ukraine. You see that from our allies, from our NATO allies, uh, from 50 other countries. Uh, and so that is happening because this president uh, has leadership and showed leadership. Uh, and we've been very clear about the one China policy that has not changed. Uh, and so we'll continue, uh, certainly we'll continue to be there for our partners and our allies out there. I just don't have any, I'm not going to respond to everything that's been said uh, out there by uh, on, on the campaign trail. Not something I'm going to do from here. And on Lebanon, uh, if I might try my luck. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> in the past two days, uh, the administration uh, kept the position of we were not involved and we did not have any knowledge about it. So my question is, uh, but you've seen what uh, the people in Lebanon endured. Uh, do you think that was act of terrorism? I'm just not going to get into it from here. Look, um, obviously, children... Uh, uh, being harmed, uh, people being harmed, uh, is um, is difficult to see, uh, and not something that we want to see. Uh, but as it relates uh, to any information or anything that occurred the last two days, as it relates to the pagers of the walkie-talkies, I don't have anything else to share beyond here. From here, you heard from my NSC colleague directly as well. I just don't have anything else to share. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, the mayor of Springfield, Ohio, has um, issued a proclamation claiming temporary emergency powers that uh, are intended for, to mitigate public safety concerns, um, obviously in the wake of the um, smear of Haitian migrants in that city. Separately, uh, former President Trump says he will visit there in the next couple of weeks. Um, I understand you have constraints as to what you say can say relating to your campaign, but in general, from a public order or community tension perspective, what do you think about that? Look, again, and we have said this multiple times, you've heard the president, you've heard the vice president. Uh, it is, um, and speaking about this more broadly, uh, it is shameful to continue to spread this type of conspiracy theory. It has been uh, debunked by the mayor of Springfield, by the governor. Uh, and the city manager, the uh, police department on the ground, and to continue to spread this type of hateful, hateful smear uh, is is uh, is just um, uh, it's just quite unbelievable that we're doing this, especially uh, when we're talking about leaders who are supposed to protect people, protect uh, communities, and it causes harm. It causes harm to everyone. Uh, and as you can see from the actions that they have to take on the ground to protect people. Uh, and so, look, we are going to continue to denounce this. We should not be tearing our communities apart. This is a president and vice president that believes in bringing our communities together. And that's what we're going to continue to see. We have to bring down the temperature in politics. That's what the president has said. Uh, and, you know, it is, um, uh, it is just really uh, shameful. Uh, uh, disgusting uh, what is being said out there. I mean, following, going down a rabbit hole, an ugly rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, and it puts people's lives at risk. It puts all of our lives at risk. Uh, and um, so it is uh, unfortunate that the city of Springfield has to deal with this. Uh, and uh, and so we are, um, we're going to continue to call that out. I do want to say a couple of things that we have been able to provide as uh, security assistance support for Springfield. We tasked DOJ's Community Relations Service to Springfield to help the community come together and enhance their ability to prevent conflict, provided four bomb sniffing dogs to help the community ensure buildings are safe and they can respond in to incoming threats. And DHS security personnel is working with Springfield and Ohio officials to support the needs of the community. But again, these are hateful spheres. They're conspiracy theories, as you know, but I want to make very, very clear from here. 
Just on that point, yeah. could we, the, you said, if I heard you correctly, four bomb-sniffing dogs. We provided four bomb-sniffing dogs to help the community ensure buildings are safe and they respond to incoming threats. Are those requested by the community, do you know, or is that a proactive thing? It's, a, it's something that we've been in touch, obviously, with Springfield, uh, the, spring, uh, the community in Springfield, and so providing the assistance and trying to give them support that they need. Which is not unusual when, situ when we're, in, we're in this type of situation and environment. All right, we're going to start wrapping it up. Uh, oh, go ahead, Kay. Uh, Green, on the subject of arms sales to Israel, um, Senator Bernie Sanders, an ally of the president, said he's preparing resolutions to block $20 billion in arms sales to uh, Israel. It's a long shot effort, but what's the White House's response to that? Our commitment it continues to be, uh, con be clear-eyed. We are uh, committed to Israel's security. That is ironclad. Our policy has not changed. Uh, we believe Israel has the right to defend itself, especially against uh, Iran-backed uh, militias uh, like, like, the, like Hezbollah. And so we're going to continue to do that. That has not changed. And obviously, we want to have diplomatic resolution here uh, to the tensions that we're seeing in the Middle East. We do not want to see an escalation. We believe that's achievable, and obviously, it's incredibly urgent. All right, Naomi. Um, earlier this week, the White House touted August data from Customs and Border Protection. Is there any plans within the administration to roll back the part of the president's border EO as it pertains to asylum seekers? So, um, as you mentioned, in the August data uh, came back, and uh, it showed that um, we July and August saw the lowest uh, encounters since Octo since September of 2020. Encounters of August 2024 were down 68 percent lower than August of 2023. Average daily encounters have decreased by 50% since the executive actions. And so we've taken this action because congressional Republicans refused to act. Uh, and so, look, we're going to uh, uh, continue to, to deal with an issue that majority of Americans care, care about, right, which is making sure that the border is protected, dealing with the border security without the help of congressional Republicans who have gotten in the way and do not provide, want to provide more assistance, more resources. And if they were to pass uh, that bipartisan border deal, we would have additional resources to actually deal with this uh, without uh, without the actions that the president has taken. I don't have any changes to, to speak to, any uh, change of policy, uh, but again, this is something that we had to do because congressional Repub Republicans refuse to take action. And so we took action, and now we're seeing uh, the effects of that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned you, um, you know, that you don't want to see an, an escalation in the, the Middle East, but given what's happening in Lebanon, what does the White House view as that escalation? What are you all looking for, for, I guess you say, things have really escalated, this is what we need to do, what's going to happen? No, we, we've, I, well, we know there's tension there. We do not want to see an escalation. We're continuing to have these diplomatic uh, conversations. This is why the ceasefire deal uh, is uh, is so important. This is why we're continuing to to, to uh, uh, engage with Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to get to a resolution here. We believe if we can get to that, uh, it will reduce the tensions uh, 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 along the blue line. So that's something that we're going to continue to do. I don't have a, a, a chart here to say what is escalation, what does escalation look like look like and what's going to trigger uh, and what we define an escalation, but we know that the tensions exist. We do not want to see further escal escalation, and we are going to continue to have uh, these conversations, these diplomatic uh, conversations to get to a resolution. Have you heard from President Biden on what he is tracking in terms of an escalation and maybe when he might say things have, I guess, taken that turn? Diplomatic resolution is the way to go. We believe it's achievable. It's urgent. We're going to have those diplomatic resolution. We want to get to a ceasefire and hostage deal. It is important to do so. We believe it would uh, lower the temperature, lower, reduce the tension there, and that's going to be our focus. Okay. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my colleagues at USA Today published a piece today about the status of the nation's uh, effort to clear the backlog of sexual assault evidence kits, um, something that uh, then Vice President Biden announced in 2015. Uh, there have been 100,000 100, kids tested, 350 million invested, and only 1,500 convictions. Is he satisfied with the results of that initiative? And what more does the president want to see done to reform new and old cases are handled? So you're right. This is something that the president um, 
is uh, very much focused on. Um, I have not spoken to him about that particular report and the findings of that report, so don't want to uh, certainly uh, say something that I haven't discussed with the president. But you heard us and you heard the president speak to VAWA, uh, a historic uh, legislation that he introduced more than 30 years ago. And let's not forget when he was senator, uh, there was no discussion about uh, what happens uh, when, a, when a woman is dealing with domestic violence or any type of violence. Uh, and so he brought that uh, to the forefront, has fought for that for the past 30 years, has been able to make uh, additional um, uh, steps, push step, make step forward uh, in, under his administration. Uh, and so don't have anything to say to that particular study. Would have to talk to the president uh, and our team. but. Obviously, when it comes to um, the issue of domestic violence, when it comes to an issue in protecting women, uh, this is something that the president has been the for on the forefront of uh, as a senator, as a vice president, and certainly as president. Yeah, Karen. That's great. Um, Jared Bernstein spoke at length about where you guys stand on the government shutdown at this point, but how would you describe right now the relationship and the communications between the speaker and the president? So I don't have a, a conversation to read out. Uh, uh, obviously, the president is in constant uh, communication with leaders, uh, with congressional members uh, on a regular basis. He gets updated by his team on what's going on in particular with the budget conversations. Uh, don't have anything to read out on that uh, uh, speaker uh, POTUS relationship. They've talked a couple of times. Uh, they've seen each other a couple of times. Uh, but as it relates to the CR, we think that there's a way forward, a bipartisan way forward. We've seen this done before, and that's what the president wants to see. Earlier and that's what the American people deserve. Earlier this week, Johnson was talking about um, Secret Service protection of Trump, but he said this about uh, the president. He said, they don't let me talk to the president very often. That may not be a big surprise to you all. We communicate through staff. It's a pretty sad situation, and in fact, it's a pretty scary situation. Is it true that the president is just not talking to the speaker? Um, it's not unusual for staff to have regular conversations with congressional uh, staff. That is not unusual. That is something that happens pretty regularly. We have an Office of Ledger Affairs for that purpose. Uh, and so uh, when there's an important moment for the president and the speaker to speak, obviously the president has that conversation. Right now, we're talking about a short-term CR. That is not a difficult thing. It really isn't. It is not a difficult thing to get done. It is a easy, easy thing for uh, action for Congress to take. Uh, it, 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 it should be something that they can decide on in a bipartisan way, as they've done many times before, and get it done, really. As it relates to Secret Service, that is something that Secret Service can speak to. Uh, um, that is something that we don't talk about from here. It comes from Secret Service. The President has been very clear after July 13th, when we saw the attempted assassination in Butler, Pennsylvania, the President said we needed to increase, he wanted to see an increase uh, in the protection, and we saw that. Uh, and so uh, the President has always been very clear about this. He's always been uh, 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 spoken uh, to that in particular uh, piece here. He wanted to see the highest level of protection. And Secret Service, the acting director said it, 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 it's happened. And so that's important too. But that's something that the Secret Service speaks to. All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Does the President believe a farm bill will happen? Green farmers and ranchers really want to know.